Good morning. I am Stephen Morris, the Banking Editor of the Financial Times. Today, I have the pleasure of moderating our webinar titled The Future of Work for Financial Institutions, Blending Office and Remote Working to Improve Productivity and Security, which is hosted by the FT in partnership with Citrix. We are blessed today with a fascinating topic that I'm sure everyone watching has experienced, has an opinion on, and are now keen to hear more from industry experts and executives on how we might organize ourselves in the future. It is clear the hybrid workplace is here to stay. Very few companies whose staff primarily work from offices plan to return to a strict five-day week, even the toughest, most hardline Wall Street firms. Staff have proved that they can be trusted and have for the most part maintained their productivity through the pandemic whilst enjoying the additional flexibility in their lives. Yet the hybrid approach has brought some challenges. Many have raised concerns about impaired collaboration, difficulty training and imparting corporate culture, as well as maintaining general workforce morale. Technological issues and compliance with complex financial regulations are other issues that have arisen. All of these, of course, have knock-on effects on customers. As we will hear, part of the solution for this is a combination of good management, positive culture, and the right technology, aimed at creating a cloud-based digital workspace accessible from anywhere. So today I am joined by four great panelists from across the financial sector, as well as our sponsor, Citrix, who we thank. So first we have Elaine Arden, who's Group Chief Human Resources Officer for Europe's largest bank, Group SBC. Hi, we have, hi Elaine. We have Gary Deleuze, the Chief Information Officer of Nationwide Building Society. Hi, Stephen. We have Daniel Engelberger, the Chief Operating Officer for Global Technology and Operations for Zurich Insurance Group. Hey, Stephen. And finally, Chris Smith, Director of Financial Services from our sponsor, Citrix. Good morning, everyone. So to our virtual audience, I'm sure you will have many questions and thoughts on this topic, which has probably affected all of you out there. So please do post them in the box on the right hand side of your screen and I'll ask them throughout when pertinent. And hopefully we will have a few minutes at the end for a dedicated Q&A. So I'm going to go into our first topic area, which is implementing the hybrid workplace. How are financial institutions adjusting to the fundamental changes determining where and how staff operate? How are these changes improving the employee and most importantly, the customer experience? So I think the best place to start is with an overview from our four panelists who can talk a little bit about their main takeaways from the past 18 plus months of coronavirus. What are the new working practices you've adopted? And now I know from personal experience covering them for the FT that the banks, building societies, insurers we have here today have made some pretty major changes in a very short period of time. So it'd be fascinating to hear from everyone today. Um, and I, I think we're gonna start with Elaine Arden from HSBC, please. Thanks, Stephen. Um, well, I guess we were just delighted at how all of our colleagues adapted to working through lockdowns. It really forced everybody to think about the things you just mentioned, think about the customers, think about how work gets done. So I guess at one point we had about 85% of our global population working at home. That's about 200,000 people. And that was in all sorts of circumstances. As lockdowns came in around the world, we had people loading kit into vans to take it home, to, to get set up. We had to get dispensations for some traders to work at home, and, and I'm sure others had, had similar. I guess kind of the, the, the lessons are we surprised ourselves at how well it worked. The shift to Zoom and managing everything on screens was really fast. Um, it, and virtual everything, right? Virtual training, virtual events, virtual meetings for everything kind of became the norm. But as you said, over time, people also said they kind of, they worked longer hours, they lacked boundaries a bit. Um, and of course they missed the, the human interaction. And we know that staring at a screen all day isn't healthy. So we had to put in a lot of messaging and wellbeing support to encourage people not to kind of fall into that. I guess as we, take the takeaways from the last 18 months, we just think it's a missed opportunity if we just kind of drift back to the old ways because we can. Uh, we trusted people, as you said, to get the job done and they did. So for us, hybrid working is not just about you know, where people work, it's keeping the focus on how work gets done and how we work most effectively for our customers, how we work really well in teams 
and then of course for an individual's own energy and, and we think the majority of roles at HSBC can be done in a hybrid way and we really just owe it to each other to make the most of, of all those takeaways and all those learnings. We're, we're really quite excited about the opportunity to do that. Yes, um, I remember even your CEO, uh, Noel Quinn, abolished the executive floor during the pandemic and now all the top executives uh, hot desk. Um, which was a, a very, I think, one of the more radical executive uh, changes in executive working life that we've seen so far. Daniel uh, from Zurich, I'd like to bring you in next. What's been your main sort of takeaways from the past 18 months? Well, first of all, uh, I don't know how the rest of the uh, panel thinks and uh, the audience. I must say I underestimated in the first place the impact COVID will have on all of us. So when I heard of it, uh, you know, starting in, 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 in China, uh, the first thought was, oh, it's still far away, but uh, it wasn't. It came so quickly globally. And I remember, uh, just as a little anecdote, I was skiing in, in, in Austria uh, end of January, and I got a call from my peer colleague from the crisis management team saying, hey, I'm just driving. This this was Sunday morning. I'm just driving back from Italy, and the sit situation is getting worse here. So then we agreed, OK, we call in a crisis management uh, session for Sunday afternoon. This is what we did. And from from there, the whole thing started. So as Elen uh, indicated, we brought our people into work from home. So we have about 55,000 colleagues around the globe. Um, Fortunately, we were on a journey before with our infrastructure, with our tools. We use Teams, cloud-based. So we were able to bring all of them into a work-from-home environment very, very quickly, which was you know, the first step to physically ensure safety. And then all the other pieces uh, kicked in. Mental safety, as Elen uh, mentioned, right? We introduced uh, uh, several formats to stay close with the teams. Uh, to stay close with our customers. Um, also, the way how we, we, we do business changed pretty dramatically, to be honest. So uh, also a small example, the pickup rate of some digital interaction with some customers in our industry was pretty low in some countries. Now, COVID enforced this. So uh, the pickup rate increased that uh, increased uh, dramatically. So we had to change how we work with our customers and also how we work internally with our colleagues. And the hybrid, mm -hmm. the hybrid work will be not going away. And I'm, I'm pleased that it will not because it gives us a lot more flexibility, all of us as, as a work uh, population. But also, I think we can bring the best out of it. So there is times when you need to have quiet work and you can do this at home or you uh, have innovative sessions at the office environment and this is what we are you know trying to 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 get better to we are not we are not there because uh, as a global uh, company in some areas it fits better in some other areas we still struggle a bit but um, the whole pace of mm. of of it has has increased quite a bit but what i'm very pleased of is that our colleagues adapted uh, very very quickly as well and and we were able to serve our clients across the globe we didn't see a ditch and this this is fantastic because that's uh showing high morale and yeah, yeah so quite some learnings quite some learnings. i see you uh, nodding along to a lot of those points gary um from nationwide so i'll just kind of bring you in for your initial thoughts on how things have changed at your company yeah thank you very similar to what elaine and, and daniel actually outlined um you know we I remember back in March 2020, um, we ran a test for about three days to see how it would work if we had to react quickly and, and move everybody to, to working from home. And uh, we were really surprised actually, not only how well the technology worked, but how colleagues adapted. And, and literally three days, four days later, we went full scale, 18,000 people working from home. Um, predominant focus at the time was how do we protect our colleagues? How do we protect our customers? And how do we make sure we look after people and make sure that they're safe, make sure that they're well, and, and not just our own colleagues within Nationwide, but our whole ecosystem. So all of our partners, our suppliers, making sure that the, the, the supply chains are working and they're safe and making sure that our, our colleagues in our partner networks are also safe. So once we'd got to that point and established, you know, look, this is this is not going to be a, a week or two. This is this is something that looks like it could be here for a while. 
we then started to look at, okay, how do we effectively deliver service to our members and continue to deliver to our members throughout this period? Um, sorry, just in case you're interested, our, our, we often um, interchange the word customer and member in this context. So we're a membership society, so we, we talk about mm. members a lot. Um, but the predominant focus for us then, I think, shifted through the middle of 2020 into things like digital servicing. As Daniel said, how do we make sure that we can continue to, to serve our members? How do we make sure we continue to protect our colleagues and our branch network? How do we make sure that we get that model working so that we can we can best support each other through this? And as we went through the year, I think we saw a switch from our members to much more digital self-service. Um, and we started to see, obviously, a growth in cashless transactions. So we see the transaction volumes increasing. So as we went through the year, we really focused on making sure that we could best support members and, and colleagues through that period. And then I think towards the back end of the year, when we realized this was going to be a longer duration, we started to see uh, well-being effects start to kick in. So we started to look very closely at how do we make sure we get that hybrid model working. For some people coming back into the office and working around people was important. So how do we create that safe environment? And then for others, you know, making sure that they they continue to support, um, so we continue to support them from the perspective of working safely from home and, and making sure that you know, they're in a good place and they continue to work well. So it's been a it's been a learning journey for us really through the last eighteen months. A lot of it's been really focused on learning quickly, adapting, and, and supporting. And as Elaine said, you know, I'm really proud of of how we've been able to support both our colleagues and our members, but also so impressed with how people have adapted to this. And you know, they've they've worked tremendously through this period to to continue the, to to work really well. Yeah. And finally, uh, Chris from Citrix, I mean, you will have a slightly different experience, you know, trying to serve all these companies and help them, you know, you know keep operating at sort of um, their maximum capacity, but also presumably face your own challenges internally and in how to keep working. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, you know, echo a lot of the thoughts of the other panelists. Um, slightly different for us being a technology vendor. Um, mm -hmm. I think the technology transition was relatively seamless for a lot of us. Um, you know, my own experience is I was a hybrid worker prior to COVID and continue continue to be now. So I think the technology uh, impact was less. You know, our initial focus at the start of the pandemic was, to your point, yes, looking after ourselves, but also our, our customers um, and making sure everyone was safe, like, like the others have said. And as we transitioned through the pandemic, I think some of the key things that, although technology was consistent, the way we worked, the way we serviced those customers changed dramatically. I think that other the panelists have mentioned it. Suddenly we have, weren't having face-to-face -face interactions. They were all remote. You know, mm -hmm. How were we running those interactions? How were we making sure that experience was great for our clients? Things like connectivity experience became super, really, really important. Then we'd not thought about a lot of those things. And we tried to try and help our employees and our staff really cope with that as well as their own well-being you know we all went through challenging times how do you help people feel safe and, and well but also help them with this new way of servicing our customers as well <laughs> balance with everything else that was that was going on around them so i think that was one of our biggest learnings how how that customer interaction changed quite dramatically and how people had to adapt and evolve the way that they interacted uh, how, regardless of their location using some of the some of the technology that um, that occurred. I think as we progress through, like, like others, I think we're starting to move now to thinking about how we work in that hybrid model. A lot of people are seeking that face-to-face -face collaboration, that, mm. that interaction with both clients and colleagues. Um, and I think we're taking steps to help deliver that, but while still making sure people feel safe, because I think there are differences, everyone's different, everyone feels very differently about the current situation. So yes, we want to ensure people collaborate. We also want to make sure that people are safe and their wishes are being respected in this changing times. Exactly. Um, so just very briefly, I'd like to hear from all four of you. Um, you know, where where are you now um, versus, let's say, the nadir of the pandemic when you know it was almost one hundred percent working from home, apart from essential workers or people who don't work in offices. You, where do you hope to be by the end of the year in terms of you know? employee occupancy in offices or, or you know hybrid work number of days in number of days out and where do you think you will be hopefully in in 2023 when you know the majority of this pandemic is behind us uh, and i think we'll start with daniel this time 
Thanks, Stephen. So it very much depends uh, country by country. Obviously, yeah. in some countries, we haven't opened offices yet, so 100% uh, working from home. But um, the other extreme, if I call it like this, is here in, in our home country where the headquarter is, where I'm located, Switzerland. So we have an average occupancy of 40%, 40%, which is pretty good. And uh, we are not aiming to get to a 80 something percent. We'll never get there, right? So, but maybe 50, 50 plus percent will get there maybe by the end of the year here. And uh, from a hybrid working approach, we haven't uh, uh, reached out um, to the colleagues saying, you know, you can have X amount of days fixed working from home uh, globally. Other uh, companies did that. Our approach is we say roughly three to two, three days in the office, two days from home. That's a guidance. Uh, we, we, we think that the teams need to, to manage this amongst them. What best works for our customers? How do we best serve our customers? And the C teams need to manage this. So uh, summary from 0% to 40%. This is the span we have at mm -hmm. the moment. Uh, and looking forward, maybe 50 plus percent will get there. Yeah. And Gary, how are you approaching this? Yeah, e equally varied, I think. So um, our branch colleagues continue to support our members in our branch network. We have about 650 branches through the UK. So we're still supporting uh, our members through that. Um, in the back office, I think about half our people at the moment have started to use our buildings again. And what we've said is, you know, come back in if, you, if it works for you, if, it, if it's something that you want to do. So we ran a survey to see how people felt about coming back into the office. And, and we've taken that into consideration. And like I said, it does vary. You know, some people very much want to come back. Um, some people want the, um, the opportunity to work from home more. So we haven't been prescriptive. We haven't laid down any specific rules. What we've said to people is, you know, if it, if it suits you to come back into the office and work from the office, do that as and when you wish. What we have done is um, we've got social distancing in place, obviously, in the offices. We're, we're looking at ways in which we can protect people. So we're at about uh, a maximum of about 50% occupancy across most of our office estate at the moment. Um, and so we know about half our colleagues as well are, are sort of starting to use the buildings a day or two a week, a little bit more. And what we've seen is as people come back in and actually start to reconnect with their colleagues, they start to get that energy of being in a room together, sharing and working and collaborating it becomes a little bit infectious, if I can use that term correctly in the context, but um, people do start to want to come back in a little bit more and start to want to engage. So we're seeing that gradual drift back towards that model um, where yeah. people do come in and collaborate and then, like I say, do work from home for a few days a week. Yeah. Elaine? Yeah, very similar, actually. So globally, about half of all colleagues um, kind of working at home. Um, because lockdowns, as Daniel said, are kind of coming and going around, around the world. So it's quite different depending on where you are. For the UK, we've reopened the office buildings. And um, maybe to, to Daniel's point, um, you know, as people start to use the office, we're, getting, we're building quite a lot of energy there, actually. People are quite excited to see their colleagues again. Um, so we're up to about a third of pre-pandemic occupancy in the the head office and you know we only opened properly the the other week so um you know we're, we're getting a steady uptick kind of daily and yeah we need to find a better word than infectious i guess because it's, <laughs> it's that excitement's kind of building and i guess what we've said a bit similar we've said hybrids about the work not, not you know not just the individual it's about the customer it's about the team dynamic um, and, and as well as the individual's own energy and, and how they bring that to work. And we're just trying to get the best of both, a bit of home, a bit of workspace. I guess that the other thing you mentioned, Stephen, the redoing the workspace, you know, it was a great opportunity mm. to be able to get into offices and actually refresh them quite considerably. So the other thing we're doing that's getting quite a bit of energy and comment is, you know, that we've changed the, the office space, much more open plan, mm. people book desks, apps for food delivery um and as you said obviously uh, the executive floor now kind of open plan as well much more collaboration space so you know teams able to book space where they can get together and work because that's why they're, that they're coming in to do that and of course as you know we've already said we expect to reduce 
office real estate by about forty percent. So, so we're kind of seeing what we expected, and we're really delighted at how how excited people are to come back and and see their colleagues. And what we've asked is that the teams really work out how's that rhythm going to work. We won't get it right first time, so everybody just needs to kind of test and learn. It's not one size fits all. Some teams are actually in at particular times of the month because of the work they do. Um, so it's not one size fits all, but a test and learn. But just keep the conversation going. There's going to be plenty of grist for the mill. And, and the, the main thing for us is keep people talking about what's working, what the little niggles are, and keep kind of talking it out and, and stay connected. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Chris, I want to move on to the, the final um, sort of uh, question in our first topic area. I mean, what, ha you know, what have been the, the most positive experiences of how you're dealing with customers? You know, has this working from home experiment unveiled better ways to serve clients that, you know, either were there before or that underutilized or that you, you hadn't expected to see before? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think there's, a, you know, a few real benefits. I, I think less kind of travel commuting time frees up people to engage more with customers, um, whether that be um, our employees, our executives, you know, we can we can be more accessible to dedicate that time to um, to servicing our customers. I think it's been interesting how, when I've been having some customer interactions, how everything, each interaction has become a little bit more humanized now. So you're no longer all in an office, you know, you're at home, actually, you've got your webcam on. People can see a little bit of insight into your lives, into your home life. And I think that really helps build relationships and rapport and, and a human interaction with our customers. And, and we found that really beneficial. You know, clearly there's challenges to that as well um, mm. with home, home life balance. And I'm sure we've all had children run in when uh, we're on customer calls, but I think that humanizes the interaction and helps build those relationships with customers um, and gives us that time to dedicate to customers. So I think those have been some of the advantages that we've seen um, through this more more remote working. Yeah. And Elaine, did you have any uh, kind of thoughts on this? I mean, running a global or well, one, one of the last sort of truly global companies, you know, have you found that there are some advantages to not having to do absolutely everything in person? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we traveled around the world seeing clients and customers and so on. And I guess, you know, there was a point where you realized you could actually meet customers from kind of all around the world in a day on a screen. Um, but obviously, you know, over time, that, that kind of screen based relationship is fine when the, the relationships established, people know each other, you know, and you can kind of shorthand stuff. I guess we're looking forward to just getting that that balance. But what we are seeing, like everyone else, is that acceleration of customers using those tools. Um, and what we're doing in a lot of markets is just saying to customers, you know, what, what really worked for you? Um, and so for a lot of them, when, they, when the relationship is established, to say that they, they, they enjoy the, the ease of the, the virtual connections that, that we did more of. But it won't surprise you that when people are getting to kind of personal financial discussions, you know, their preference is very much when, when it's in real financial advice, um, particularly personal customers, you know, they, they want to sit and look someone in the eye. That face-to-face -face mm. thing really, really matters. Yeah. Gary, is that your experience as well? Yeah, very much so. I think, you know, our strategy is to have that mix of face-to-face -face and digital servicing across um, our entire range of products and services that we offer. So for us, I think one of the one of the things the pandemic did was to really accelerate the digital agenda and really look, make us look very closely at how better can we serve our members in this context. At the start of the pandemic, a good example of this was um, the regulators engaged with us on you know, are you able to offer payment holidays for your members um, that are getting into financial difficulty as mm -hmm. a result of the pandemic? Now, we absolutely responded to that as requested, you know, immediately set those capabilities up. But we found, you know, the contact center inundated then with people wanting to, to request a payment holiday. So we looked at ways in which we could move that request online. And traditionally, an IT project to build a customer journey from start to finish to do something like that might have taken you know, six to nine months because of the investment we've made in cloud because of the investments we've made in, in building out digital servicing capabilities and selling capabilities we got a, a payment holiday journey up in 10 days and that allowed us very quickly to to take those requests from our members and, and actually start helping them um, better manage their finances and and that again led to for us some questions around well if we can do that in 10 days what else can we do in 10 days 
you know, can we take more and more of our products online? Can we take more of our selling and servicing online? So for us, that's really opened up a, a really great conversation inside the organization around what we're calling now the sort of future of legendary services. How do we mix digital and face-to-face -face interaction? We're doing much more video conferencing now. As Elaine says, you know, being able to talk to our members directly at home to, you know, to help them go through their finances and perhaps apply for a, more, a mortgage or a loan. That's something we've seen grow through the pandemic and digital transactions and, and cashless processing and, and so on. All of these things have, have grown and grown. So for us, it's about getting that mix right, get, making sure that we can continue to serve, making sure that we continue to provide what our members expect of us, but then really helping them to, to make that switch to digital, which might be more convenient for them if that's, if that's their preference. Yeah, yeah. And finally, Daniel. So what have been the positive much, customer customer service yeah. takeaways? So customer, but also maybe um, you know our employees' takeaways. So customer, pretty much similar as Elaine and and, and Gary uh, and and Chris said. So the, the the barrier to interact is a lot lower, right? So you have access uh, quicker, and uh, there's a positive and a negative side to it because the, the days are, are are getting longer for everyone, you know customer side but also our side uh, and from the mixed perspective so uh, physical and digital I think we are still on a learning journey there you know how how the best balance of it uh, is the adoption of digital interaction um, accelerated quite a bit that would never have happened without mm. being you know forced from the outside to be honest for us as well, what I wanted to mention is uh, we have sustainability very high on our agenda. And obviously, this whole digital interaction reduces the need for travel. And it did just prove that you can replace some of these meetings we thought we can never, ever have digital uh, by having them digitally. Uh, and yeah. that's a good thing also for lowering the stress of our colleagues who, you know, traveled quite a bit uh, throughout their, uh, you know, year. So positives, mm -hmm. but still on a learning journey. Definitely. Now, our next topic area is uh, HR challenges. Um, you know, what human obstacles lie in the path of a successful transition to hybrid working? Some of the examples here would be a lack of collaboration and socialization between staff, perhaps reduced opportunities for remote workers to learn and development. The difficulties of onboarding and integrating new staff just from a practical perspective but also i guess these days from a cultural perspective as well i mean how do you learn the company's values and how to operate within them if you're just sat at home so i think i'll just leave that uh, as a general thought oh, the main hr challenges um and i think we'll go um to gary first on this one i mean you know has there been an element of trial and error you know what's worked what hasn't and um you know what new training and so from a hr lens have you brought in yeah no it's a great question and and i think you're right it's been it's been trial and error in some respects we found our way through the pandemic and looked at ways in which we can um help our colleagues i think i was reflecting on uh this about two weeks ago i came into the office and we've, we've opened a new building in central london um we opened it just before the pandemic um not the best time to open a new building but um it's a it's a phenomenal facility and we are starting to to get some colleagues back now but um i bumped into a colleague that i've never met in person before so yeah. she's been in the organization for 18 months and, and we spoke almost on the first day of the lockdown um on teams and then we've been working together for 18 months and it was a great experience to actually meet face to face for the first time, but we talked about her journey through the organization, how she was onboarded into the organization, how she's worked remotely, and how she started to come into the office. And there are so many processes that traditionally we'd have run as physical processes that we, we went straight to a virtual process very quickly. And what's, yeah. you know, what's been really remarkable, as Elaine said right at the start, is how flexible people have been through this process. So it's been very much a case of, you know, we will we will learn as we go through. We will make sure that we best support our colleagues and we'll make sure that we, you know, we do whatever we can. And, you know, whether that's our colleagues working in this country or some of our partners who are working in, in places like India, you know, that duty of care extends out to the whole network. So we've made sure that, you know, we're doing the best thing for all of our colleagues and all of our partners wherever we can and working with our partners to to again work through this and make sure that we are really really focused on on colleague well-being um but it is it is something that we're learning as we go through 
Yeah. Uh, Chris, what's your perspective on these HR challenges and some of the human obstacles to get hybrid working right? Yeah, I think um, I think you touched on a lot of them. I think we've all we've all experienced it. I think trying to um, retain a positive culture and and actually uh, define what that culture is to new joiners is very difficult remotely. I think mm -hmm. I think Elaine mentioned it. It's, it's it's probably easier with people that we know and we've worked with for a long time, but it's it's even more difficult for people joining an organisation to do that. Um, I think the collab. You know, when when we started COVID, I think a lot of us did the. The virtual socials you know the virtual pub quizzes i'm sure we all and they seem like a long time ago but i'm sure we all did that um but actually i think then we moved quickly on to to that well-being making sure people were um were, were able to do their job effectively and collaborate um and deliver what they're expected to do effectively remotely and i think one of the biggest learnings for us and for me personally is is the proactivity needed i think from a executive and management level you know, I think again, when you are when you can be fully in an office, you bump into people, you see people, you understand and see if people are well or if they're struggling or need help. It's a lot more difficult in a hybrid yeah. world. So I think it takes a lot more proactivity, um, and that's not micromanagement because I think that has the opposite effect. But actually, checking in more, having a different type of cadence with your people to make sure that they are okay and whether if they need help, they can deliver that. I think that's one of the biggest changes that's happened in remote working, but also we'll continually th need to think about as we move into a hybrid type of world. Yeah, I mean, from a personal perspective, I was made um, a team leader, a manager for the first time when I was promoted to banking editor, which became effective on the 1st of April, 2020. <laughs> I had to learn how to do, how to manage people, including two new hiring and having two new people start. Um, during this whole pandemic so I'm, I'm very keen as we start to come back you know through this autumn and, and into next spring to to actually have sort of a more seamless and, and human human way of doing this so it was a real you know i had to make sure i made the effort to schedule things and reach out and, and talk to people perhaps in a way that i wouldn't have had to if i'd just seen them five days a week you know for eight hours in the office um uh, elaine um i just want to bring you in quickly on that and then um we've got a couple of audience questions coming in um, so I'm going to transition over to those, which which dovetail very nicely with our topic. Sure, maybe I mean everything everyone said is is exactly yeah. on it, right? Managers having to be more intentional, as you say, it's not micromanagement, but just those follow ups, the stuff we all did virtually, you know, inducting graduates and interns and all of that stuff has been phenomenal actually. But it takes a lot of effort to make sure it works for them because everybody's a little bit different and what they need. I think one thing as we go forward. Um, and actually, there was a recent study, I can do the geeky bit perhaps, Stephen, there was a recent yeah. study in um, a nature journal, um, Nature Human Behaviour, and it used the data from Microsoft employees through um, six months of the pandemic, just to kind of map out the networks, what was going on, what was the interaction. And what that showed was, you know, collaboration and networks became more siloed, a bit more mm. static. And that, and basically, there was less interconnection beyond, you know, if you like, core, core groups. Information sharing was was limited, and a lot of it, you know, in comparison, w was you know asynchronous. You know, it was happening by email and so on. And I think everybody felt that it was kind of fine, but it kind of felt transactional and took a big lean in to to, to manage it. So, trying to get the best of both, trying to get that human interaction back. And I talked to one of our new senior managers recently who joined in January and she said she came into the office first and, you know, meeting people in the team and all of that in July. And she said it was like I really started in July. Mm. So I think we have to be really careful and thoughtful and realistic about human behavior because things like FaceTime does matter. Um, it's how humans are made. You know, we're social animals and people will congregate around the boss. So as we've been yeah. talking to managers about how they manage the return back in, just being really aware of that, being aware of people's reactions to things like fear of missing out and to keep the dialogue going. Other old behaviours will kick in. So if you've got half the team in one city and then the rest globally, are you going to go back to that Zoom, people Zooming into a room and a big desk and actually talking to the team about does that work or, or whatever? But I th So I think being conscious about human behavior and as i say encouraging people to keep the dialogue going and we've fallen into old behaviors what's working for you what's making the team most more effective and you know more importantly 
um, ultimately what's working for customers. Yeah, exactly. So we've got um, quite a few audience questions now. I think two of them fit quite nicely together. The first one is, you know, can the panel talk about their experiences of asking people to return to the office? You know, how are you approaching it? How is it being received by staff? And then as a corollary, you know, um, are any of the panelists experience any retention issues with staff who want defined or total flexibility in their roles? I.e., you know, are you concerned that you might lose staff if you do mandate some days back in the office after they've got so used to, to, to either picking or being totally working from home? I think we'll go to Chris first on this one. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think there are the challenges with um, asking or telling people to come back to the office, um, not only from a, their personal view perspective and safety, I think that's paramount. You know, we've done a lot of work with ensuring our office space is safe through through the use of technology, self-certification, temperature checks, office booking, you know, all, all that kind of things that technology plays a key part in. But actually some people potentially are having a better experience at home than in the office. So it might not be that they don't want to come back because, um, they have a safety concern but actually their experience their technology their um their working at home is a is a lot more effective uh, in their belief and potentially have that, that home home life balance i think for us we we have given people choice uh, and actually that's been our um strategy throughout and i think if you can make the office a safe working environment and if you can ensure that you deliver um that consistent and very positive experience in the office that matches their experience at home. And I don't, we haven't had specific challenges with encouraging people because I think we've talked a lot about people do, a lot, most of the people do want that human interaction as well. I think there's very few people who do want to sit at home all day, every day. Um, so I think if you can get those things right in terms of safety for me is a, is a baseline and, and make that experience of the office as good, if not better than home, then I think it is encouraging people back. And we haven't seen you know much resistance because we, focusing on those areas yeah. so daniel what's your experience of um asking you know people to come back you know obviously running a global company i appreciate this is different in zurich to how it would be perhaps in singapore or hong kong and are you worried about you know as a as a big financial services company are you worried about retention so as gary earlier pointed out we ran several surveys in many countries as well and asked for preferences right and what clearly came out of it is that especially younger people couldn't wait to come back to the office they wanted to socialize and and also people as elaine pointed out who recently started right because they want to get into a network and and they want to collaborate physically and then you have uh, another portion of of employees who say oh this daily commute is pretty long, right? I have to take care either of, of young kids or of elderly parents. So it, it suits for me better if I work more days at home. So we are not mandating, as I said, we are offering. And coming back to what Chris said, uh, we want to make our physical um, office environment as safe as possible. So also checking certificates, uh, keeping distance and, and, and all of it. So we need to take care of the population who comes to the office, but also respect, you know, flexibility of people who think uh, working from home is better in their period of life. So coming to your second question, no, we are not concerned of a retention. Um, because we offer that flexibility. Yeah, uh, Gary, same question. Uh, yeah, and a very similar answer actually. I think we've yeah. <laughs> we've gone out from from day one with the surveys, and you know our CEO announced recently that you know we are prepared to offer all our colleagues um, within areas we can the opportunity to to work in the way that they want to. So you know, apart from specific areas where we're servicing our members, such as branch network and, and some of the um, specific back office operations, we, we've given everybody the flexible option. I think what we've seen is, is a gradual uptake again into the sort of safe working environments that we provide in the offices. What we've started to do is to really, at a local level within teams, is to sort of start having the conversations around, you know, where are the opportunities to come back together again? So collaboration and celebration, you know, the two areas where we want to, people to, to get together and to work you know, it, it, again, it's back to the decision for the local management teams and the individuals themselves as to how they want to participate in that. But we're encouraging people to come back together to, to collaborate, to develop, to celebrate successes. And, and 
what we're seeing is a gradual uptake in that area. So to date, we've seen people engage where there has been opportunities for um, meetings for people to come back and work in that way. On a retention basis, no, I think I think the, the, messenger, sorry, the, the message around flexibility has been well received. So yeah. from a colleague retention perspective, actually it's working really well at the moment. And you know, I'd echo what Daniel said around the different demographic groups within within our colleague groups. You know, we're seeing different levels of engagement and different styles of working and, and that flexibility is helping people to navigate their lives. So that's definitely helped from a retention perspective. Yeah. Now, Elaine, among your peers in global banks, we've seen some very different approaches. Uh, we've got the Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley idea of, you know, if you're happy going to a restaurant, you should be happy coming back into the office, uh, as uh, James Gorman memorably said a few months ago. You know, uh, David Solomon of Goldman Sachs saying, you know, this is this has been an aberration. Life will go back to normal. We expect you in five days a week. Uh, pretty pretty similar approach from JP Morgan, at least in the investment banking side of its business. And then you have things like Citigroup and UBS saying, we think, and, and HSBC, I would imagine, we think our offers of flexibility will actually be a recruitment advantage. We believe we'll be able to attract more and potentially different talent by changing our working practices, you know, presumably in light of what you're seeing existing staff and potential recruits asking. What are your opinions on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, back to one size doesn't fit all. These are quite different organizations in terms of, you know, their clients, what they focus on, and to some extent, I guess, cultures and how they work. Um, HSBC is where, where you said we, we think linked to some of what the other guys have said are, are offering and our, our discussion about flex and hybrid working is all just based on that piece that we, we trusted people through the pandemic to, to work well with each other and get the job done for customers. So why would we suddenly stop doing that now? What we're just trying to get is a better balance because, you know, you wouldn't say lockdowns and always being at home was was necessarily a healthy environment. It's actually quite a difficult mm. environment. So our, our key premise is we trusted people. We're going to continue to trust people and want them to try and make sure they, they work out together in, in teams with that guidance that, you know, we want hybrid working, we want people to get the best of both, we want people to create the community for particularly those early in their career. Um, I think on your, your point about um, attrition and so on, not necessarily seeing that, and actually we're seeing hybrid and, if you like, a, a more modern working environment being a real opportunity for access to talent. Uh, we all were in discussions about the impact on different parts of the community during the lockdowns and and, and some of the burdens on, on different populations. So we know that there are some groups that, you know, more control over how they work and when they work in their working environment. So people like carers, working parents, even things like neurodiverse colleagues who actually like to interact in a different way. That, that's really important. So we think actually part of this is the proposition about working here and actually is a real win on potentially access to more talent from, from hybrid working. Yeah. Now, one of the other major challenges, you know, has obviously been, you know, IT and technology. Um, so I think one of our final topic areas would be, you know, have there been any technological problems with the, the hybrid approach that need to be addressed? you know um and um how have these how have these been solved um you know have companies been able to ensure you know a consistency and experience between home and the office did was a lot of investment in new technologies required or, or, or did it all exist and was perhaps just being underutilized uh and um chris i think you're probably the best place for us to start here you know uh you're running a tech code yeah, uh, thanks, Stephen. I think there's, there's been a number of challenges. Uh, I think in the initial phase, getting everybody up and running was a challenge. I think that uh, for most people on the call, I think we've articulated that was that was quite quick and executed quite yeah. well. And I think then we moved on to some of the other more security type challenges of the boundary of people's working environment suddenly very different. Everybody's working from home and that introduces very different security challenges which are obviously really important in the sector. You know, people using their own devices, people being able to do things at home that they couldn't do in the office just opens up to a broader security threat. And actually the security landscape is heightened significantly. You know, Phishing attacks have, have gone through the roof. People have used this as an opportunity to try and attack individuals and gain access to everybody's organization. So I think there's been a lot of 
challenges of that security perimeter. Um, the other few areas that I think that are probably not most talked about is, yes, people are working from home, but how can we give them that support at home? So we've given them technology, we've given them tools, but actually this has been quite new for people. How do we help them? How do we support them if they've got challenges? How do we make that experience very positive? Whereas previously in the office, if you had a problem, you probably went to somebody in IT and got them to help you. That no longer exists. How do we make sure people are continuing to work and be productive? Because actually the boundary of responsibility for our IT organizations has changed. Suddenly you're on a home Wi-Fi network or you're not on a corporate Wi-Fi. Whose responsibility is that? to and that probably introduces some hr challenges at the same time whose responsibility is that to maintain upgrade it make sure it's suitable for the work you're doing so i think the move to remote working was successful but i think it introduced some of these broader challenges around security experience the boundaries of our infrastructure and whose responsibility for that that need to be addressed and have been to a certain extent but continually need to be thought about as we move back into the hybrid world yeah, um, I just want to quickly get Daniel's opinion on that, and then we'll, we'll ask our sort of final question or final topic area as we reach the end of the session on the financial you know, workplace of the future. So, Daniel, just a bit about security and IT. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I very much echo what Chris uh, said. So, um, as we all said, uh, the first step, well done. Um, we, we, we made it easy for people working from home. Uh, security, so some pieces were in place. We had multi-factor authentication in place already. We closed down quite uh, very much uh, the devices, meaning not able to print from home and, and these kind of things. Uh, but um, data loss prevention was a topic. So how could we get our hands around this a bit better? Um, and, and what's the biggest topic for me is less on the security side, but uh, also was what Chris said. So do we have the right uh, network capacity available from home, but also now in offices, right? Because in offices, we are having video conferences now as well, which we didn't have in yeah. the past. And, and then the very last piece I wanted to stress, because I had an awful experience in the first place when I had a hybrid meeting, uh, you know, right after the uh, return to the office. It was awful. It was really awful. It didn't feel like one meeting. It felt like three meetings. We had people yeah. dialing in from home, some here in offices, some in a room, awful. So this is where we have gone on a learning journey. We are not there completely, but we are getting better. It now feels with the technology we implemented, the bigger screens, the Teams uh, screens we have, uh, a lot better, but this will still be uh, a challenge for us going forward. Yeah. So um, we've actually got two audience questions on our final topic as well, you know, um, and I'm going to go to all four of our panelists and then we'll wrap up. Um, the financial workplace of the future. How will the work environment and technology underpilling it evolve in the coming years to further enhance the employee and customer experience when hopefully, you know, the pandemic is behind us? Um, so if you could just you know, uh, somewhat succinctly, um, give us your views on that. I know it's a huge topic. Uh, we'll start with you, please, Gary. Um, so I go back to digital with a human face. I think we've got to get that blend right, both for colleagues and for our members. I think it's really important to provide that always on service 24 seven, but also be able to be there from a human perspective. I think for us, it's finding that balance between the two. You know, I expect from a colleague perspective, you know, enhancement of these kind of teams capabilities, see more telepresence kind of scenarios coming in with new devices, new capabilities over the coming years, um, and then extending that out to our customers, our members directly. So again, being able to reach inside people's homes if that's what they want and be able to interact with them where it's most convenient, um, or enabling our branches to be more places where they can come and collaborate with us both face-to-face -face and digitally and learn about new digital skills so that they can do that in, in the sort of comfort of their own home. So getting that blend right i think i think we'll see a continued evolution of that capability that we started a few years ago yeah and elaine yeah i mean i think it, it accelerated trends right lots of this was things that were happening and everybody was talking about as if you know it was all going to be a decade away and so on so digital a, a more modern workplace different tools that people use the blend of of virtual and and in person and humanizing technology we we've used a kind of similar term but also, I guess it's the brilliant learning everybody got on how do you get work done? What is an organization when, because we kind of thought of buildings as the organization, if that makes sense. So 
Mm. What is it when, when you're not doing that? What is this network of people sharing information and connecting with each other? So I think the other thing we just want to keep is that we tapped into the energy and the empowerment of people. What are we here for? What are we trying to do? What does good look like? And how do we work well together? And that's the thing we've got to hold on to as, as, as we go forward. Yeah. Uh, and Daniel, workplace of the future at Zurich? Hybrid, for sure. Leverage what we have learned over the last uh, couple of months uh, in the good, but also in the bad sense. So what, what absolutely did not work and what, mm. what worked, keeping the balance right, as, uh, as Gary said, and balance for customers and also for our employees. Yeah. And I, I'll give the final word to Chris from Citrix. Yeah, I think, again, echo the other panelists that I'm going to steal Elaine's word of trust. I think we've trusted people before, so why won't we trust them moving forward? I think that's a really important point. But I think the key is making sure people have the ability to do the right work in the right place and that right environment. And just, just quickly, when I went into the office for the first time, it was brilliant. I saw loads of people, had lots of conversations, but I didn't know work. I was like, I've actually done no work today. Um, so I think it's about... And, and this will evolve, I think, through the workplace and workplace design, people actually doing the right type of work in the right type of location and giving them the um, facilities, tools and technology to be able to do that, making sure that experience is consistent and brilliant wherever they are. So we can push and you know, pull people in or out of the office where they need to do. And, and technology is going to clearly have a, a massive role to play in that and drive that remote and hybrid collaboration. People need to learn, relearn how to collaborate, I think, in, a, in this hybrid model. And technology is going to play a key part in all of those things, which, which is great for us, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, um, all that's left to do is to thank uh, our four great panelists. I mean, I have another dozen questions, uh, as do our audience, so we could keep talking for another hour. But unfortunately, we do have to wrap up. So thank you to Elaine, Gary, Daniel, and Chris, uh, and Citrix, our sponsor as well. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>